POV Sona Citri. I was, not having a good day. Where did it all go wrong? Was it yesterday, when I was blown up? No, I think I can go further back, it wasn't even when I agreed to watch over Lord Lucifer's. Bastard. Truthfully, I think it was when I was born. Yes, everything started to go wrong when I met my sister. I love Seraphal, dearly, but Satan's below, I want to strangle that girl sometimes, often. Sister, please. I begged, quietly of course, I didn't want to ruin my image. My poor Sonatan, don't worry I'll find the meanie who blew up all over you and beat him up. Of course, she would phrase it that way, while trying to molest my rear. Seraphal. Lord Beelzebub spoke up. I thanked whatever higher beings that listened, there was at least one sane Satan left. And no, I didn't count Lord Lucifer or Lord Asmodeus, wherever he was. Fine, my sister happily skipped back to her seat. Okay, as I was saying, can you please start from the beginning, Sona? Lord Beelzebub asked again. I took a deep breath and began. I was heading over to Shimoda's house, because he had been absent from school for three days at that point, counting that morning. I took a glance at Lord Lucifer, he was serious, but seemed to look almost disconnected from this meeting. As I was tasked to do, I needed to check up on him to make sure he was, safe. And how did he act, like a different person, maybe like someone was controlling him? Lord Beelzebub asked, jotting down some notes. He made a comment that I didn't expect from him, but if I was to question if it was him or not, it sounded like how he would say it? If that makes sense, Lord Beelzebub. I see, and you didn't find any magical anomalies? No, sir. I didn't sense any magic in the area. Okay, continue. I had to force my way inside and I was going to confront him again, possibly use a more thorough hypnosis to figure out what was going on, but I was surprised when I saw all the drawings covering the walls. Yes, I have several pictures here. He picked them up. And you have no idea where these came from? I do not have the faintest clue, if I had to guess it was some kind of magic. I'm only aware of human magic by rumor, knowing that it involves a lot of calculations. And isn't that a revelation, apparently Shimoda knew magic. I'm not surprised. He stared at the pictures intently. I had to sit down and figure some of these out myself. It looks like he was calculating the position of the stars in this one, and over here was the gravitational force exerted on an object moving at the speed of light. He began to mumble several more things before coughing and looking back up. Unfortunately, most of it was destroyed and I'm unable to piece it together. So, he's smart, then? Seraphal added. This is some high-level stuff, I can tell there are a few magic formulas mixed in, so its nature isn't in question. If he's able to use this appropriately, well, I wouldn't deny him the title of genius. Ajuka Beelzebub admitted. And there is no evidence of him using magic before this? I was surprised when Lord Lucifer finally spoke, I didn't think he was listening. No, sir. I said Kami, just earning a hum from him. Continue on, Miss Citri. Lord Beelzebub gestured. When I asked him about it all he said. I have taken the drugs, then asked me if I wanted to see a magic trick. Pfft, my sister snorted in laughter, holding her mouth shut. It looked like he pulled some kind of bracelet out of his hat, it appeared expensive, not something I would think he had. I don't know where he got it. Then he said, for my next trick, I'll make an asshole devil disappear. Before turning the bracelet into a bomb and throwing it at me. So, he knew you were a devil. Lord Beelzebub mumbled. Admittedly, I didn't focus on that part, I guess he did know I was a devil. That brings into question many things I didn't think about previously. I am still angry he tried to blow me up, but thinking about it now, it wasn't a very powerful explosion, even if I didn't cast a shield in time, it wouldn't have done any lasting damage. But that didn't mean I would forgive him either. After I recollected myself, I saw the house on fire and ran back inside, using my water magic to douse the flames. But at that point nearly everything was destroyed and Shimoda was nowhere to be seen. He most likely knew a teleportation spell. Lord Beelzebub sighed. Thank you for your report, Miss Citri. I looked around the room, Lord Lucifer and my sister didn't look like they had anything to say so I stood up, gave a bow, and left. There was already a teleportation circle on the floor, outside of the meeting room that I stepped into and was taken back to the school, directly into the student council's office. The burst of light died down and I saw Rias pacing around the room. Rias? I questioned. Sona. She hugged me, I guess this whole thing had been a bit stressful on her as well. 
Well, it wasn't like she was reaching for my butt, I didn't mind returning the hug. Rias, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. She waved off my concerns, walking over to the couch and plopping into the seat. How did it go? I already told you everything that happened, they didn't really express their thoughts either. I just shrugged, this wasn't something I could really interfere with, nor could I add any insight. Rias groaned. How was my brother? I paused, not knowing how I should answer. Rias was Sir's ex Lucifer's sister, but was I supposed to speak ill of Lord Lucifer to his own sister? He seemed distant. My red haired friend sighed, mumbling something about her stupid brother. Of course. She said curtly. Him and Grafia were fighting last time I went over. It was hard to separate political issues from friendship when both our siblings were part of the ruling body, but at this point in our relationship, it wasn't difficult to know when something was meant just for us. What happened? You know, she got mad at him when he finally told her about Takao. There was a big fight and everything, I think mom took Millie Cass in for a week or so. Grafia and Lucifer's story is well known, it's rare for them to love each other so much that Lord Lucifer didn't get a harem. Rias smiled slightly. Grafia wouldn't mind if brother had a harem. I think she was more pissed that he hid his son from her rather than finding out that he had sex with some other woman. There might also be a little jealousy from how hard they had to try to have their child and he accidentally had one with a human. That did fit in what I knew about the strongest queen, Grafia Lucifuge. Then there was the fact that he pushed the responsibilities onto her too, I don't think he once even checked up on Takao. It was Grafia that had to tell Millicast that he had a brother in the first place. Rias let out a groan in frustration. I love my brother, but he never was really good at being a father. I think Grafia does most of the parenting as it is. I can see how that would anger Grafia. It seemed like Lord Lucifer just wanted to put him out of sight and out of mind, even if others had to look after him. I could understand a bit, it would be difficult if the old Satan faction found out that the strongest devil had a bastard that didn't have any power. Be it for political reasons or using him as a hostage or something, it was probably better that Takao just stayed away from the whole of devil society. Well, I guess that plan had all gone up in flames, quite literally too. And don't even get me started on mother. Rias threw her arms up. I don't think she's even talking to brother right now. She is and has been pissed to find out she had a grandchild she never got to meet. I couldn't help but quirk a small smile. That sounded exactly like Rias's mom, Lady Gremory. It's no secret how much she dotes on Millicass. She wouldn't care if Takao was reborn as an angel, she would have dote on him all the same. What are we going to do, Sona? Rias asked. What do you mean? We have to find him, right? What if he was kidnapped or... Rias, I don't think he was kidnapped, it looked like he left willingly. I just... She slumped down in her seat. I could tell this was eating at her. She never interacted with Takao in any capacity, I think she was too, scared, no that probably isn't the right word. I guess it was just difficult to get involved in the conflicts between those she considered family. Our siblings are already going to look around, you know we can't blow this up or it would make everything worse. Yeah. She said quietly. How about you, Rias? Did you ever find out what happened to your familiar? I wanted to change the subject, thankfully Rias was pretty good about reading the mood. She insists that she doesn't remember how she passed out. I'm betting she was probably attacked by a bird or something and didn't want to admit it. Rias huffed. I checked up on Issei too, just to be sure. Nothing seemed wrong, but Kaneko said his dragon smell was getting stronger. He might be close to activating his sacred gear by accident soon. A dragon-type sacred gear, Rias really did luck out sometimes. I was happy that she was going to add another member to her peerage with potential, but I was still a bit miffed that I was emotionally blackmailed to hand him over to her even if it was for a good cause. She needed all the help she could get right now. You should hurry, if it activates before you add him to your peerage, he may not want to join. Rias was many things, but proactive was not one of them. She would procrastinate until things either fell into place or blew up in her face. I'm still working out on how to approach him. She waved me off. I just rolled my eyes, that was code 4, I'll deal with it later. Rias may be my friend, but I can't hold her hand her entire life. How about a game of chess? I offered. I guess, it would be nice to take my mind off everything. The library was massive, there were shelves that ascended to the ceiling, all filled with books. Beautiful, beautiful books, each one holding information on a subject I didn't know. I found a table in a back corner, 
I didn't want to be disturbed. There were probably a hundred books all stacked up around me. History of Skyrim. The Edra and Deidre, A Look into the Divine. Schools of Magic, A Beginner's Guide. The titles continued, everything I could possibly want to know about the place I found myself in. I don't know how long I sat here reading through the books, sometimes not even finishing one before seeking out answers from another. It wasn't just mundane books either, I found many, many spellbooks all mixed in. There were sections dedicated entirely to a single spell, both its applications, theory, origins, and counters. It was marvelous just how much knowledge was stored in these ancient halls. I wish I knew some magecraft for memory retention other than memory partition. I wasn't crazy enough to attempt that on myself without hundreds of variables accounted for. No, I just had to settle on the old-fashioned way of reading through each book one by one and taking notes as I go. If there was one thing aggravating it was having to use a quill and ink. I made a promise to myself to bring ballpoint pens back to this world in the future, or at least keep several hundred on me at all times. I was wondering where our newest, wayward student had disappeared to. I heard the voice and looked up, a bit surprised to see the archmage standing a few feet away from me. I hadn't even sensed him nor heard his approach, what a monster. I rubbed my eyes, looking up. Air, I think I may have lost track of time. I would say, do you even know what time of day it is? Night? That is correct. He said a laugh. It is night, of the following day you arrived. Oh. I guess I really did lose track of time. I am merely giving you a hard time, it is no problem. He said lightly. Talfder was just worried you had become lost somewhere. I see, I suppose I should go make sure he knows I'm alright. I paused. But I'm curious, do all new students get the attention of the Archmage? I raised an eyebrow. I would like to say yes, but my schedule can be rather hectic at times. It is hard to greet and teach every student in the college. I can barely manage with one lecture a month. So, what makes me so special? He sat down in a chair at my table, picking up one of the books and giving it a once-over. You are an enigma. You've been watching me. I guess it was obvious, considering how quickly he responded to Ancano's defeat. I cast my gaze at every new face that comes to our little corner of Skyrim. He was being awfully open about everything, I guess it isn't really something he should be ashamed of. But there was one question I wanted an answer to. Why didn't you help them with the ice wraiths? That is a difficult question to answer, it would take a while to explain the intricate history between the college and the town. To put it simply, they didn't ask. He sighed, closing the book in his hands. The Jarl is a very, prideful man. Ah, that makes more sense. The leader of the town didn't want to have to as the college for help, it would be an insult to his pride. What exactly, do you want from me? I'm curious about those runes you used in your fight. He said, raising his hand in the air. He invoked characters that looked like runes but were not any I was familiar with. This is a standard lightning rune, I don't think I need to point out the differences to you. I see, they have their own runic language here. But it was quite different, it looked like a single rune housed all the power and then created a spell circle to modify its intent and meaning. I moved my hand into the air and drew a Yura's rune, letting it start to channel my mana and take on the properties of lightning. Fascinating. The Archmage said. I shared his thoughts. A spell circle to amplify and actualize your intent behind the rune, that is quite interesting. Both spells dissipated back into magical energy and dispersed. Who? Cool. He raised an eyebrow. You understand the mechanisms of the spell with merely a glance? You just get more and more interesting. You want an exchange of knowledge, is it? I usually hold my mysteries close to my chest, but I don't mind a fair exchange. If you're wanting my knowledge on the runes I know, then you will be disappointed. I frowned at his sentence. Did he not want to share his knowledge? I can't in good conscience trade something that is already available. He reached out his hand and a book flew out from a nearby bookcase. He didn't even look as he placed it in front of me. I just blinked, looking at the title. How to Apply Runes. And the author was one, Savos Aran. You know, where I come from, other mages would have happily taken this offer, and laughed at me for getting tricked. It wasn't too different here, at one time. When I was younger, it had to be over a hundred years ago, the competition was much more, aggressive. He shook his head and sighed. Those days are long behind us, competition is good, but I make sure there are lines drawn so nothing gets out of hand. He gave a genuine smile. So, what can I bribe you with? I liked how upfront he was, 
made things much easier. To be honest, I don't know. Money really doesn't have much of a value, maybe some raw materials to create my own magical foci, but even then, I'm not quite sure what I need. I thought out loud. He was being rather open with me, I wasn't against speaking my mind. Oh, crafting a staff. He looked at me inquisitively. Actually, I was thinking of making a sword that could be used as a staff. I pictured my old, jeweled sword. It felt more, right, than just a staff or something similar. Interesting. He rubbed his beard. I have a few ideas. He turned over his hand, and something appeared in his palm, a small black ring without any engravings. I saw your hat the other day and it inspired me to make this last night. He offered it to me, and I inspected the ring. Did you? Indeed. A smirk grew on his face. The idea of attaching a folded spatial dimension onto an object. What a novel concept, I don't know why I haven't heard of it before. Most mages, when they get adept enough, just create their own little pocket carved out in the void of oblivion. There are concerns doing such a thing, and it's not particularly difficult to seal off another mage's access temporarily. But this, it would be incredibly hard for outside interference with accessing the contents. Granted, the space created is more limited, but it's a safety precaution that can't be denied. I heard his description and nodded along. I wouldn't trust their method of storage if I had anything precious to store. IT seems like someone would be able to break into another's storage dimension if they were experienced enough. What's all this? I asked in confusion as I peered into the ring, looking at the space inside. Did you think my offer was only the ring? I added in all sorts of materials, there should be enough to figure out what you want to do. There were many ores inside that I didn't recognize, along with many other items I had no idea what to do with. Wait, how did you already have this prepared? I didn't, I just put that together now. Ah, one I keep forgetting, this whole college is probably his workshop. I doubt there is anything that goes on that he doesn't know about, nor anything he can't meddle in. You are one scary old man. Why, thank you. He took my compliment with grace. You're not even here right now, are you? I looked at him, truly looked at him and something felt off. His smile grew wide. Interesting, explain to me how I'm not here and I'll give you something good. I thought for a moment, looking him over. A thought projection, overlaid with a physical illusion using the college as an anchor, no that isn't right. The magical energy, the magicka that permeates the entire college, if I had to guess, I would say the source flows through somewhere close to your body, the wellspring so to speak. You can use it to project your consciousness or maybe astral project yourself anywhere by piggybacking off the dense flow of magicka. You are a scary young man. He laughed, setting a slab of what looked like glass on the table. Why, thank you. I smiled back. What is this? I picked up the glass. It's called blue glass, I don't know if it is official or not. Its counterpart, green glass or just glass, is a material used in making glass armaments. I take it this is rare. I peered at it closely, channeling a bit of my mana inside. Unbelievably so. That is all I've found in the past decade when I first heard of it. Interesting, the material practically ate my mana as if it was starving. This would make a wonderful material for crafting. And the term, glass, seemed like a bit of misnomer, just holding it in my hand, I could tell this wouldn't lose out to steel in toughness. Is the college against students leaving for extended periods of time? I felt like I now had a goal to strive towards. The image of my sword was starting to come into focus. We like all our initiates to be able to defend themselves otherwise, we don't really restrict their freedoms. Most students don't leave for journeys until their later years, but I guess your circumstances is a bit out of the norm. He said with a good-natured chuckle. But perhaps there is a better avenue for you, I'm guessing you haven't had a chance to see our job board yet? Yeah. I just scratched my cheek, looking around. I pretty much came straight for the library and haven't left. As the name implies, it's a board in the common room that lists all the jobs available. We provide the necessities here, food, board and even some novice level ingredients and materials. Otherwise, you are required to provide for everything else you need. We often get job requests throughout Skyrim, a lot of which is just enchanting weapons or making potions and we let our younger members handle it, paying a small commission fee to the college, otherwise taking the pay for themselves. Interesting, I wouldn't mind completing a few jobs while I look around for some materials. Wonderful, we're quite backed up on requests as is, any experienced mage would be a boon. He hummed to himself before pulling a few more books off the shelves. I believe you will need these. 
I looked at the titles, Enchanting for Novices, Herbalist's Guide to Skyrim, Mixing Ingredients, A Potion Master's Memoir. Well then, I guess there's no point in hiding my ignorance. Thank you. I said it before, young man. I look forward to seeing the things you accomplish. He withdrew an apple from, somewhere and brought forth a knife from the same place. He cut a piece off, putting it in his mouth while setting the rest on the table. Make sure you eat. He gave me a wink, chewing on the fruit. You were here the entire time, weren't you? Or did he replace this projection with his real body when I wasn't paying attention? Who knows? He chuckled, walking away. Once again, well played. I'll write down some notes and send them to you. I said, to the empty area, but I'm almost entirely sure he heard me. I happily bit into the apple as I put the books away. Urag or is it Urag Groshub, is it all one name? Well, I'm just going to keep calling him Urag in my head. Urag just gave me a grunt when he walked by. From my interactions with the man so far, that is the highest of praises this he can give. I did read, Erskim a book on the races found in this world. An orc or orizomer, how interesting. They were made out to be berserks, not in the insulting sense, but the warrior type. I guess it's rare for an orc to pursue the path of a mage, especially to find one running a library. Well, one thing was for sure, I don't think anyone would have any idea about messing around with his books. Cleaning everything up, all that was left was my notes on runes that I was going to hand over to the archmage. It was already gone when I took my eyes off it, but I expected that. You won't get one over on me again. Well, my debt has been paid, what should I do now? I did have a schedule for lectures but nothing interesting was coming up in the next few days. Though, next week the enchanting master was going to do a live demonstration, I was looking forward to that. Well, to the job board it is. It was a lovely night. Even if I hadn't slept in over a day, I still felt really refreshed. I think devils can operate on less sleep, so that is a boon to me as well. Also, does my minor shapeshifting counteract things like poor hygiene? I knew some small spells to deal with such issues in a pinch, but even after a couple days, I didn't feel particularly icky. Still though, I felt like a bath would be welcome. I fiddled with my new storage ring, it was truly a good piece, just seeing this up close, I knew that the enchanting practices of this world would be a benefit to me. The terminology wasn't a one-to-one -one transfer from what I knew, but the mystic code crafters back home did similar things. And these materials were very interesting as well, I didn't recognize any of them, no doubt they were all native to this dimension. I would have to grab a book on metallurgy when I have the chance. Oh, Tolfdir. I called out, seeing the older mage walking down the path. Hello, Wilhelm, I see you've managed to escape from the confines of the library. He gave a small laugh. Ah, yes. I said awkwardly. I seem to have lost track of time. It is no problem, my boy. He pat me on the shoulder. I wish more students had the same issue. It's hard enough to get them to study through the tomes when I assign specific work. All the young ones these days just want to get straight to throwing fireballs. Well, to be fair, I remember doing that as well when I was young, I think we all did. The Archmage was kind enough to point me towards some specific fields of study. I was actually just going over to the job board so I could get some things done while I gather materials outside. Well, I don't think anyone would say no to another hand with those, we have a few that are starting to get impatient. He scratched his chin in thought. I don't think I need to question your ability either, I believe Enkano will vouch for your magical prowess in combat. His lips curled up slightly. Geez, Enkano must really be hated. Talfdir comes off as someone who doesn't dislike anyone and always happy to help, yet even he is willing to take a jab at Enkano. I have a few moments before I need to head to my next lecture, why don't I show you where everything is? I would appreciate it. I thank the old mage, he was a really kind man. I actually didn't really know where the common room was, I was guessing it was connected to the living quarters. He led me towards the rotunda, in the corner, there was a door that led to the tower on the left side. It was large, going both up and down many levels. Here we are. He gestured. I looked around, there were a few bookcases, some chairs, and tables, even some students quietly reading to themselves. Quite cozy, if nothing else. And this is the job board, it's nothing extravagant but it gets the job done. He smiled brightly at his own joke. It brought a small smile to my face too. The job board was, overflowing. I could see why they needed a hand, I guess their services are never in low demand. Any jobs I can't take, 
or is it all fair game? You will have to bring it up with Sergius Tyrannus. He overlooks all jobs and requests for the college. I heard my name. A man walked over. He was also on the older side, an imperial, bald and wearing standard mage robes. Ah uh, yes, here we are. Wilhelm, meet our resident master in chant, Sergius Tyrannus. It's a pleasure, I look forward to your lecture next week. I held out my hand and he grabbed it without any fanfare. It's always good to see new blood in the college. So, what can I do for you both? I was just going to take a job or two while I go out for a bit. I spoke. I wanted to know if there were any stringent requirements on what I could pick. As long as you're able to accomplish the jobs, I won't make any unnecessary demands. He came off as a no-nonsense kind of guy, straight to the point and didn't mince his words. I turned towards the board, I saw one that stood out the most. After hearing about this and seeing it here, my interest is piqued. I tore it from the board, still looking for another. I saw an older one, a bit ruffled in the corner and saw who commissioned it and where I was required to go, while I could choose worse places. Taking it as well, I handed them towards Sergius. An enchanting request by the companions over in Whiterun. He eyed me, then looked back towards the paper. There is a reason this one has gone undone for so long, even if the companions are famous throughout Skyrim. They tend to not be very friendly towards mages, the quintessential Nord, if you will. I got a friend who went to Whiterun and wanted to join he companions, I want to see how he's doing. I explained. I see, well the requirements are just basic enchanting, nothing a novice can't do. Nord, especially the companions, don't like anything over the basics. They'll want sharpening, durability, and anti-rusting, maybe a few other requests, but they shouldn't very much. I think I can handle that. I can just read the enchanting book on the way there. As for this one, this one is a bit more complicated. You aren't the first to take this request. We had an adept mage give up this request halfway through, saying that a powerful necromancer had taken up residence under the statue of Meridia, which is why it has been acting up. He gave me an inspecting look. Are you sure you can handle this? I'm confident in my combat ability. He just shrugged, I guess it wasn't his job to dissuade people from taking jobs. He also left this. He flipped his hand over and I could tell he pulled on his own personal space to pull out an object. It was a crystal life object, spherical in nature with many flat sides. He said it was a key, not explaining anything else. Oh, and before I forget, the materials for the enchanting job, which will be deducted from your earnings when you return. He handed me a small bag. I just put all the stuff into my ring. Well, if there's nothing else, I want to get these jobs done as soon as possible. I wasn't even brown-nosing before. I really want to listen to his lecture on enchanting next week. I'll make a note of your departure, there aren't any time limits but don't dawdle. He walked away, seemingly content with everything. Make sure you have plenty of supplies. Tolfter looked slightly concerned. Potions, magicka and healing are a must. A good stamina potion if you need to run away, maybe even a few scrolls. He rambled on, but his intentions were appreciated. Don't worry, I'll make sure I'm properly prepared before engaging an unknown mage. I smiled. Yes, of course. I'm sure you are no stranger to the more dangerous side of our profession. He just nodded and I couldn't help but wonder what he'd heard about me. I mean, I only showed off a lackluster duel between me and Encano, that couldn't mean much. I guess there were also the ice wraiths. Maybe the archmage said some things I didn't know about. He said his goodbyes and walked off towards class but my attention was turned elsewhere. Are you going to skulk forever? I called out, taking a few steps out of the common room. I saw an elf, a boss mare, I believe. There were many kinds of elves here and it was almost hard to keep track. I noticed him trailing me from the time I had met up with Tolfter. Greetings, friend. He gave me a strange look. I couldn't help but overhear that you are searching for some, materials. Ah, that's what this is about. He must be trying to make some coin off me. Well I don't really care as long as I can get what I want. So it seems, and what can you do for me? You're new around here, so I thought I would introduce myself. You see, I'm someone who can, acquire things, maybe even of a dubious nature. Oh, well now this just got worth it. Are you now? Well, I'm in need of something particular, something that may be rare and might be hard to acquire by normal means. Allow me to introduce myself, I am an thur, scholar, and humble merchant. How could I be of service? 
I thought for a moment before pulling the blue glass out of my ring. Can you get me more of this, I don't care if it's been forged or not. Hmm, a type of glass I've never seen before, I can put my feelers out but I don't know if. Money isn't an issue. I know just who to ask. I look forward to any future business. He said happily, walking away. What a strange guy, though I don't dislike that sort of person. Well, even if it turns into nothing, I would rather fail and try than to ignore a possible lead. This glass will be important for my sword. I was lucky enough to catch the old man before he left on his cart. Apparently, he had spent all the money I paid him before, so he was going back to work. That was his life, he would take travelers here and there, then shack up in the latest tavern, spend all his coin and do it all over again. I can't really blame him either, that sounded like an easygoing life. It wasn't very hard to convince him to go to Whiterun, originally, he was going to Windhelm, but a bit of gold changes his plans easy enough. Though we did pass by and I saw it at a distance. I would like to check it out at some point. That being said, I did take a note of how much gold I had left, about a couple thousand septims, the currency they use here. One gold meaning one septim, obviously. I wasn't quite sure how much gold I would need, I met that weird guy earlier and he was searching his sources for any blue glass. And gods know how much that is going to cost, and I was also on the lookout for any other materials that caught my eye. Well, I just pushed such thoughts to the side for now and cracked open one of my books. It would take a little more than half a day to reach White Run, so I may as well learn the basics of enchanting here. The text was a bit dry, but there seemed to be a lot of similarities between this and what I was used to. Even runes made another appearance, albeit not in the farm I was familiar with. One of the most common methods to craft a mystic code was to carve runes onto the object, my cane sword being one such example, here they do things a bit differently. Runes are carved onto an enchanting table and then used to imbue an object with their concepts as opposed to being used directly. It made the enchantments somewhat weaker than what I compared to my memories, but it made it so almost anyone could pick up the craft without much trouble. What an interesting method, I'll have to do experiments with this when I get back home. One of the key ingredients of soul stone. On the surface, this thing seemed repulsive. I wasn't against using things as materials to further my own goals, but even I wouldn't take someone's soul and use it for crafting, normally. Anyways, these were a bit different than what I expected on the surface. The name was apt, they housed souls, but not anything sapient. These stones absorbed the souls of defeated foes like rabbits, deers, bears things of that nature. And it didn't even consume the soul to use, they acted more like batteries than materials in of themselves. After being used, the souls would simply dissipate from the stone, returning to the natural cycle of the world without any harm done. The runes and enchanting table made use of the soul's power to both apply and even recharge enchantments on items. It was a simple, yet robust system they created. I was genuinely impressed at the ingenuity. The basics were easy enough to understand, I felt confident enough to put them to use later, but now I was curious about the next levels. Was it just more of the same, but harder enchantments, or were there other steps that needed to be taken? It was questions for later. I just wanted to finish this book for now before arriving in Whiterun. We're here, lad. I felt a hand lightly pat my shoulder. I opened my eyes and saw the old man standing over me. Already? You were fast asleep there, didn't even wake up when I pulled into the stables. He laughed. Now hurry up, I want to head to the tavern and I can't get going until I make sure my horses don't run, so that means you need to move. Yeah, yeah. You old drunk, there wasn't really any venom in his voice, just his personality. Didn't even realize I fell asleep, it was a nice little nap. I stretched my body as I took in the view. I could see a large building poking over the walls that surrounded the city. It was impressive, for what they had to work with. The town in general looked a lot livelier than Winterhold, but it was also much warmer. Greeting. I waved at the guards who were watching over the entrance. I don't suppose I could ask for directions to the companions? They both looked at each other before one stepped forward. You look in to join the companions, son. Their annual recruitment ended two days ago. Oh no, I'm just here for a job and to see if a friend of mine was able to make it. He shrugged, stepped to my side. You see that path there? He held out his hand, pointing towards the inner city. You're gonna wanna follow that path and you'll come to an open market, if you keep going and take a right, you'll see a building with an overturned boat on top, that's the Jorvasker, the companion's mead hall and residence. I appreciate your help, here drinks are on me tonight. I handed him a few coins. You're alright, 
lad. He slapped my shoulder and laughed. Always a good idea to be friendly with the resident law enforcement. It was a nice stroll through a little hamlet, children were much more active here and people just kept coming and going. Yeah, there were quite a few more people here, many more shops and things to look at. I pulled out the job description that had more detailed instructions. So, I'm supposed to enchant some weapons for the companions, basically these super mercenaries that are like celebrities around here. To do that, the college actually has a contract with the local enchanter. It may seem odd that I would be using another person's enchanting station to enchant objects for a job in the city they preside, but it looked like the actual enchanter there is out of Skyrim for the next few years and his daughter is looking over the place. So, we just pay a small fee on an annual basis, and she lets us use the enchanting station when we come around. It saves time and money from the clients sending their items to us and potentially get backlogged that way. Honestly, the logistics just seem like a nightmare everywhere, but what can you do in this age? Finding the boat building wasn't hard, it was exactly as described, a building using a boat as a roof. Pretty neat, I don't know the history behind it, but all the same it looked important. I pushed the large doors open, walking inside. Most eyes in the building turned to me, but one in particular was familiar. Will. The voice of Dorum echoed out. Geez man, if you look so excited to see me, I'll get embarrassed. Dorum. I greet the large man who came over and practically enveloped me in a hug. Okay, I was happy to see him too, and with how he was treating me I couldn't help but smile. I didn't have many friends, so this was always welcomed. I had heard what happened in Rift 10 and feared the worst. He said, giving me a once over. I never actually made it to Rift 10. I chuckled. Rumors started spreading right before I left, no carts wanted to take me, so I headed over to the college instead. A stroke of good fortune then. He nodded. What about you, I guess you managed to join the companions. I, I've been a companion for about two days now. Come. Take a seat, tell me how you joined the college. He gestured me over to a seat, there was a bar or something it didn't seem like anyone was bartending, as it were, but he walked up behind the counter and grabbed a couple drinks, setting one in front of me and sitting down. I noticed a few more people in the room, taking quick glances our way, curious. Were outsiders allowed in here? I mean, Thorum wasn't showing any signs of discomfort, and I doubt he would disobey rules like that. I made my way to Riverwood after well. I look around. No need for that, I've already told my brother my story. We are brothers in bonds who had fought and escaped unjust capture together. I just shrugged, if it trusted these people, I would trust his judgment. Alright, so I arrive Riverwood, not much happened the cart driver tells me stories of a dragon in Rift 10, you know anything about that? Yes, even Codlack Whiteman, the harbinger of the companions has been going to meetings with the Jarl to discuss this. He explained, shaking his head. Rift 10 was hit hard, almost half the town was burned down before the beast flew away. They say that not even one warrior managed to pierce that dragon's black hide. I guess harbinger was some kind of leadership position. Well, he knew I wasn't from Skyrim, probably gave the full name and title for my benefit. The dragon bits were interesting too, seemed to align with what I knew about dragons. Dragons, crazy. Are the companions looking to get in on some dragon slaying? There had been talk, but so far we don't know if more dragons are going to start showing up. There haven't been any more sightings since, but everyone is on edge. I nodded and continued. I picked up some supplies and headed towards the college, the trip wasn't too exciting, it was nice to get a view of the Skyrim countryside. But when I arrived, the town was under siege. Bandits? He questioned. I shook my head. Ice wraiths. Those scaly ice things from further north? Yup, scary little bastards. They're elementals, highly attuned to their element so they can use ice-based magic with ease. It's that time of the year. It wasn't though Rum who spoke, but a woman who walked up behind him. Ah, Will, this is Ela, Ela this is Will. Pleasure. I smiled. She grunted. I was there a few winters ago, had an job and we stayed and helped. I turned back to the rum. She's right, the guard captain, Sword, explained that it was the time of the year that they produce offspring which involved taking people and dragging them off to who knows where. I assume you joined the defense. The rum asked. Indeed. Sword the guard captain, and the other guards were quick to act as the wraiths came, forming a strong shield wall to stop their magics from a distance. It gave me enough time to create about a hundred illusionary guards to draw their attention. And that worked. Aren't ice wraiths, 
Erm, magical. He said without much confidence. I couldn't blame him, he probably didn't know much about how magic worked. I had taken a few guesses myself, I'm not quite familiar with ice wraiths either, but they didn't have normal senses, no noses, eyes, ears or what have you, so they had to be able to sense their prey somehow. My first thought was some kind of heat sense, but they completely ignored things like torches, so I guessed they could sense magic. Dot. Are all the guards at Winterhold mages? He tilted his head in confusion. I shook my head. Every living person has magic inside of them, whether they use it or not. I assume the ice wraiths sought that out and the magic I put into each illusion was enough to trick them. Fascinating. Though Rum looked at me in awe, and it didn't seem like he was being condescending, he took a genuine interest in what I was saying. I wonder if I'm capable of make. I think everyone is capable of it, just the extent of talent. I wouldn't advise you against learning a basic healing spell or maybe even conjuring a quick flame for fire in Skyrim's weather. Though Rum let out a laugh. I, those would be handy. Well, in the future, if you're hunting ice wraiths, maybe take a few magicka potions with you and use them as traps or distractions? It may or may not work. I shrugged, it would need more testing in the future. Those illusions, along with the guards keeping them off me, I was able to cast a large fire spell and turn them to ash. I took a drink of my ale, wasn't as good as the mead I've had previously, but it was decent. It was a good party afterwards, tried my first Nord mead too. Though Rum snorted in laughter and I saw Ela chuckled too. I guess we can't call your friend a milk drinker then. Ela slapped Thorum's shoulder. It was after the party that things got a bit more interesting as well. I get woken up by some arrogant ass who is interested in my spells. I scoffed. That's just wrong, you don't wake a man after drinking through a celebration. Yes, and Kano, the Thalmer emissary. I rolled my eyes. It was weird, as soon as I said that the place got deathly quiet. Something wrong? You had a run-in with the Thalmer? Ela questioned. Geez does everyone here hate the Thalmer? Just some pompous mage who couldn't go through a single sentence without using his status as a Thalmer emissary to make himself seem special. I looked around the room and people were now paying a lot more attention. I'm still not very familiar with Skyrim, how hated are the Thalmer here? We don't get involved with politics. Ela stated, I guess she was meaning them as mercenaries. But we would happily join in any battle that was opposite the Thalmer. There were several cheers and whoops inside the room. Well, guess that answers that question. Screw it, I'm on board the fuck the Thalmer train. Even what I read about them makes them seem like completal assholes. Yeah, he mentioned something about the Thalmer giving Skyrim a strong, guiding hand, or some such nonsense. Got everyone in the tavern all pissed at him. Aye, that sounds about right. Though Rum even looked unamused. Please tell me he didn't get away with something like that. Of course not, I couldn't let the people who fought beside me get insulted like that. I was a mage he was a mage, I did the obvious thing. I took another drink. We had a duel outside of the town, I think most of them were watching as well. Good man. Though Rum gave me a salute with his drink I heard a few grunts of acknowledgement. Well, he gave me some nonsense like, cast your spell, I won't do anything until then. And to be honest, I really had to resist the urge to walk up and stab him with my sword. That got a reaction out of them, I saw Though Rum crack up, holding back the drink he just took. But well, I had my own pride as a mage. I withdrew a coin from my ring and held it up. Put a hole in his stomach about that big. You should have killed him. I heard a gruff voice join up next to Ela. I was tempted, but we did put restrictions on the duel, no killing, maiming, or hurting spectators. I didn't want to taint my own honor. It was true, I had my pride I wouldn't allow anyone to step on it, a few looked disappointed but it got better. But what I didn't tell you is that we also put stakes on the outcome. They leaned in and I just smiled. I of course healed him up, I didn't want him to forego his end of the deal because of injuries. He had a long walk back to the college, without any clothes. There was a small bit of silence as they processed before laughter erupted from the hall. I guess the Thalmer are really fucking hated if this gets everyone so happy. Then again, the Thalmer did outlaw the worship of one of the Nord's deities. That's all my adventuring for the past few days, what about you though Rum? The man calmed down, still a fit of giggles though. My time hasn't been as exciting, I joined a couple days ago it wasn't too difficult. The guard at the gate said the companions do an annual recruitment, shouldn't there be more people here if it wasn't difficult? Well. 
Not every recruit is willing to punch a companion in the face after the first meeting. Ela mused. My jaw is still sore. The man next to Ela said, in a good-natured way, and looked at me. It was my turn for the recruitment this time around, I just insulted them all and wanted to see if any had that fire in their bellies. Though Rum here is the only one who had the balls to do anything about it. Though Rum chuckled. He insulted my mom, so of course I swung. He explained it was just a ruse though, no hard feelings are kept. Thank you, brother. Though Rum nodded. Oh, Farkas, this is Will, Will this Farkas. It's good to meet a friend of Thorum's. He gave me a nod. Especially one who put a Thalmor on his ass. Ah, that reminds me. While I did come here to check up on Though Rum, I also took a job dealing with enchantments for the companions. Ela looked at me and then to Farkas. I had forgotten about that, after the last one that came by I thought the college was ignoring us. Sorry I don't know anything about that. I shrugged. Scrawny little mage came in, acting like we should worship the ground he stepped on. Farkas grunted. I can guess how that went. And when he went back, probably told some bullshit story about you guys. I just sighed, while I doubt they were blameless it seems like things just escalated on both ends. Well, I wouldn't mind doing the enchantments you lot need. If dragons are really going to be popping up, it's probably a good idea to get our weapons and armor in the best condition. Ela answered. It's just, we didn't expect anyone to come after a while, several of the inner circle are still in a meeting with the Jarl. I don't mind waiting a day or so, I'm in no hurry. I waved her off. I wanted to do some shopping and exploring anyways. Oh, why don't I show you around Whiterun, what are you looking for? Though Rum looked happy at my comment. I was going to craft my own magical foci, but I'm not too familiar with specific metals and their properties, though maybe I should stop by the blacksmith in town and see what's what. Actually, Maida was a blacksmith, I know a thing or two if you need a hand. I just blinked looking at my friend. He really is a nice guy, I'm glad to be friends with him. I started laying out various medals on the table, watching Thorum give each a keen eye, inspecting and moving on to the next. Okay, I think I recognize all of these, it's been a few years since I've heard my Daz talks about medals. Any help is better than none. I replied. Let's see. He picked up the black ore that looked smooth to the touch. This is ebony, very expensive, and hard to get a hold of. I hear the orcs run most ebony mines in Skyrim and they guard the stuff and rarely sell to outsiders. I think my Da's word were, ebony doesn't like magic, dot. That went with what I knew, I had tried to push my magical energy into the ore and I felt heavy resistance. But that gave me another question, does that mean magical resistance or immunity? Could I force enchantments on ebony with enough effort or was it a complete lost cause? Would ebony also be something that could penetrate magic as well? I didn't want to hammer though rum with these questions, I don't think he would know the magical applications of the metal. This here is Oracalcum. A bit less rare than ebony, but more widely available. I think it's easier to enchant and use magic with, and a good hardy metal. The metal almost had a green tint to it, and readily accepted any mana. The thing that stood out the most, was how efficiently it took in my magical energy. There would usually be waste, or, runoff, from trying to push magical energy into something, but this would gladly take it all. It wasn't he most conductive, but it was the least wasteful, there was the small issue that it tended to not want to let go of any magical energy it got, meaning using it purely as a catalyst for casting was detrimental. I would need something else added in to overcome this. Oh, this one I've seen once in my youth. He picked up the white like ore and looked at it fondly. Moonstone ore, it's rarely found in Skyrim, but common in other parts of the world. It's probably the exact opposite of ebony. It is one of the best metals for mages, but its durability and strength are lacking. Interesting, I hadn't experimented with this one yet. I made a metal note to play around with the moonstone when I had time. Well, that answer pretty much all my questions, I can actually start thinking up my weapon now. I hummed thoughtfully. Now I'm just missing one ingredient. I don't suppose you've ever heard of blue glass. I asked producing the small amount I had. He took the lump and gave it an inquisitive eye. Can't say I have, looks like normal glass to me, just blue. Supposed to be much better. I just shrugged, putting it away again. Oh well, can't expect Thorum to solve all my problems, he's already been an amazing help. You could always ask Irland Greymain, he is considered the best smith in Skyrim, he also personally crafts the weapons for the companions. That's convenient, is he around? 
Well, though Rum, you just keep surprising me. I heard he went out of town for something, should be back in a few days. Thorum shook his head. Unfortunate, but what can you do? I shrugged. You think he would be up to forging the final piece if I gather anything? Money really wouldn't be an issue. He does commission work sometimes, I don't see why not. We just idly chatted about a few things, I mentioned my job after this which raised a concern look from Thorum. I would make sure to have decent preparations first before going in, I guess dealing with any Deidre shrines or temples should always be taken with the utmost precaution. Yeah, the current me can't even come close to dealing with a godly being. The conversation just shifted, I think we started talking about women when the doors suddenly flung open with a bang, and several large men walked inside. Harbinger. Harbinger. Greetings, Harbinger. Everyone in the hall practically stood up and greeted the oldest man among the group. Even though Rum stood up respectfully. Well, I would mostly contribute it to respect. But there was also an underlining feeling of tension in the air like everyone was waiting for a shoe to drop. We're calling a meeting. A large, bald Nord declared. Who's that? I whisper to the rum. Skjor, one of the inner circle, he acts as the leader on the battlefield sometimes. The rum whispered back. And who are you? Skjor suddenly looked over to me, frowning. There seemed to be a bit of displaced annoyance in his voice, like he was just projecting whatever anger he had on me. Well, I think I'm the only non-companion in the room, so I guess I do stick out a bit, especially with what I'm wearing compared to everyone else. I'm surprised though Rum didn't say anything, while well, I could contribute that to them thinking mages are weird. The older man, the one they called the Harbinger, just put a hand on his shoulder. Skjor, there is no need for that. He turned towards me. And who are you, stranger? He looked at me strangely, though his tone much more even, looking between me and though Rum. Wilhelm, I'm a friend of Thorum coming to check to see how he was doing. I also took a job from the college to enchant the weapons for you all. There were some mumblings of, finally, but nothing too annoying. That temper of yours always causes problems, Skjor. The supposed harbinger looked at the other Nord. You're right, Kodlak. He just sighed. Thank you, mage, for coming. If there was ever a time to get our arms readied it would be now. I guess the harbinger's name is Kodlak. Well, it was admirable that he could let go of his annoyance and acknowledge me with respect. But there was something that put him on edge, and I had one guess why. There was another dragon attack, wasn't there? Though Rum did mention that the higher-ups were talking with the local Jarl about this. There was silence in the room I saw Skjor scowl, seems like I hit the mark. Your eyes show more years than your body. The Harbinger commented, staring at me intently seemingly unperturbed by my own comment. I paused, returning the stare of the old man. I held back a frown at his words, I didn't like being poked like this, especially in public. There was certain decorum that should be observed, blurting out someone's personal matters like that was just rude. Can you feel it? I heard the dragon ask me, but I could roughly guess what I was sensing from the man. It's because he's closer to death that it's more apparent, some of the others have it as well. The stench of beasts and rage roll off of him, I'm surprised no one else noticed. Was he cursed? I think something has a claim on his soul, something powerful. Well, I wasn't one to let it dig at me without returning in kind. And you smell like a wolf. There was another long pause. Some looked confused, possibly even angry at my insult, yet only a few others winced and looked at me intently. Well, you started it by saying something like that, old man. My eyes traced down to Skjor who slowly put a hand on his weapon. I looked back up and met his eyes, daring him to draw it. My hand flicked with the familiar feeling of magical energy, I was ready to cast a spell if need be. Skjor, what did I just say? The harbinger admonished his own companion. Mage, you are well learned, what do you know of dragons? Did he just ignore my jab? No, I think he just didn't truly care at the moment, I guess this whole dragon thing has got him a bit concerned. I withdrew my magical energy and contemplated the question. Dragons are, power given form. I said after a moment. Their scales are tougher than steel and they boast a natural magic resistance that would leave the best enchantments jealous. And what of the enchantments you can provide, are they any help against such creatures? Was he testing me, or did he want to know my worth? I don't know this old man was a strange one. Regardless, it was a logical question to ask in these circumstances. A lot of the flashier enchantments act more like spells, which will just splash helplessly against a dragon's hide. Ironically enough, the basics would probably have the best effect. 
Enchanting a sword to become sharper wouldn't be interfered with against a dragon's magical resistance, opposed to say, igniting in flames. It will be done then. He nodded. Skjor, make sure all companions' weapons are enchanted and ready for battle. The Jarl is calling all banners and prepping Whiterun in case of disaster. I'll get it done. Skjor grunted, not looking too pleased but I think he knew to look at the bigger picture. Mage. The Harbinger called out. How much do you know? I had a feeling he wasn't talking about the dragons at this point. I can take a few guesses, how much time do you have? Not enough. He sighed. You can always seek out the Archmage. I offered. We've never gotten along with the college. He frowned. Yes, I've heard that excuse many times now from both sides. I'm on pretty good terms with the Winterhold guards, I even drink together with them at the tavern. I took out a quill from my ring in a piece of parchment, scribbling down a few lines on it. Perhaps someone just needs to extend their hand. I rolled it up and offered it to the older man. I saw him unroll it and stare at the contents. This. He said in confusion. It was a formula for some medicine, should stave off his death for a couple months. I was using my knowledge from my home, but it should transfer here relatively well. Should by one or two months, at most. Consider it an apology for my words. I waved him off. I'll get out of your hair and wait at the local enchanter for your weapons. Though Rum was staring at me, expectantly, as I started enchanting the various weapons that were given to me. Luckily, the enchanting station was in a back room so I didn't have much to interrupt me, but his gaze was eating into the back of my head. I guess it made the most sense for Thorum to bring me all the companion's weapons, him knowing me and everything. It's not like you to hold something in. If I've done something you don't like, just say it. I picked up a sword, it felt different than regular steel, but I couldn't find anything specific that made it different. The Harbinger said he was cursed and close to dying. Thorum finally admitted. Ah, that was a smart decision on his part. Everyone is entitled to their secrets, but some things can cause rifts in friendships. I honestly didn't expect him to say anything, maybe I'm just cynical. Do you know what's wrong with him? There it is. I have a general idea, but I hope you're not asking him to tell you. I'd rather not have a complete falling out with these companions. No, he sighed. Even if it wasn't the Harbinger, I don't wish to pry into matters that I don't belong. That's why though Rum is a great guy. I can't do anything to help him if he doesn't want it. I could predict his next question easily enough. Do you think the Archmage at the college can help? He asked me, a bit of hope in his voice. I give it even odds, that man is frightfully competent at what he does. Which was true, my few interactions with the Archmage led me to give him such an evaluation. I don't doubt he would be a high-ranking member of the clock tower if he were back home. Not to mention the sheer vastness of knowledge the college has collected in its years. So, there's nothing I can do. Thorum asked, a bit disappointed. I was going to ask why he cared so much, but then I realized I had known Thorum for about the same amount of time Thorum had known the old man. Yet, I still developed a bond of friendship with him that would compel me to act to save his life all the same. I'll tell you what, I'll make some inquiries when I get back to the college, see if I can speed anything up on the chance that the Harbinger listens to my advice. Thank you. Thorum blurted out immediately, giving a big goofy smile. Just tell him to not overexert himself after he drinks the potions with the ingredient list I gave him. It only stimulates some latent potential in the body to give him sort of second wind. If he starts being active, it will drain it away faster. I'll make sure to pass on your words. He said happily. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.